Okay, so I'm going to start with the Gandhi article. And you aren't required to have a reaction, but um, Quickie, everybody has to speak at least twice this, this hour. So if, uh, if you don't speak this time, you have to speak the next time. So be prepared. And um, all right, so we'll start with that and then we'll go into Buddhism. Uh, here we go. Share screen. All right. So it's about the balance between East and West. Um, of course, that's this, you know, a pretty stereotypical um, uh, view of each one. You know, it's oversimplifying, but the ultimate conclusion is that we have to put them together. So any one person, any one society at any particular time is going to have some combination of these. But I know that the AUW students know that the best schools in most of those countries really emphasize STEM, science, math, technology, that the developing countries are in a lot of ways um, trying to mimic the West in their education. And so I don't think this is horribly oversimplified or inaccurate, uh, but it's up to you. A lot of you know more about this than I do, and I'm happy if a student uh, takes issue, then the next time I teach it, I, I make a point of that or I change what I teach. So I'm completely open to my students educating me because as a matter of fact, they know more than I do about some of this stuff. I think also when you grow up in a culture that's Hindu, Buddhist, Confucian, you do know more than someone who just studies it. Um, so anyway, don't, don't hes hesitate. Um, so neither ancient wisdom nor modern science is complete. Um, they need each other. They, one without the other is, is seriously flawed. So, okay, so here's another thing about, um, by studying the spiritual tradition, tradition of the West, you remember when he said he read the Sermon on the Mount and he thought it was really great. And he thought Westerners should really try following their own religion. <laughs> they would really change. Um, and then he, it made him, it brought, it awakened him to going back and studying his own Hinduism, Hindu tradition, because he had just grown up with it. He hadn't really thought a lot about it. So hopefully, you know, the students in this class, by having the class, I'm just sort of awakening you to, um, what you really think. And I also think uh, awake, awakening you to the whole history of humanism, ancient and modern is a very important um, set of ideas for all of you to think about. Um, okay, so in the end, you know, he stayed faithful to his own tradition, but by doing that, he actually pulled out the, the best of the West also. Um, and then the, the people of India were awakening their own spiritual consciousness. Um, I talked about this last time where when I went to Indonesia, one of the requests was to explain why America is the greatest country. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> America has its problems. Um, so America should be true to itself, but Indonesia should be true to itself and not try to imitate the West in a very mindless way, which um, I think a number of my students say uh, is happening, or to some extent it's happening. It's, it is a problem that definitely has not been resolved. Let's put it that way. Um, all right, the life of the spirit. So the word spirit um, in the Greek view just means living for the sake of something greater than yourself. So you can have a kind of humanism that actually is spiritual humanism. And all of those manifestos, even though many of them would reject the word spirit, um, the Greeks have a nice use of it. It's natural for us 
to look for patterns and seek justice. That's a natural way for us to flourish, but it's also what all the religious or traditional ancient cultures um, also were, was built into the fabric of their view of, and again, I don't think you should call it religion, but their philosophy. Um, so the way Gandhi acted, and this is really important because there are going to be lots of demonstrations in your lifetime. They're going to be climate demonstrations like there were at the, um, in Glasgow. Lots of young people. It's called Fridays for the Future with Greta Thunberg what were, was the main organization that sent all those mostly young people, unfortunately, and I, I get their mailings every week or so if you want me to forward it to you. Anyway, so there are going to be a lot. There was Black Lives Matter. There, and you have to think about, do you want to think of them as spiritual in a spiritual humanist way or in a you know Christian nonviolent like Martin Luther King or Gandhi nonviolent or Buddha? Uh, there were a lot of Buddhist monks that engaged in nonviolent demonstrations during the Vietnam War, but that's going to be a, going to be a thing. So you can think about that. Um, then there's this other thing where we have to understand um, we we can't separate ourselves from sin or evil, and that's the Greek uh, tragedies was trying to get you to empathize. So I think humanism is based on empathy. I can understand why somebody would stab their husband to death, right? <laughs> or cripple, you know, um, psychologically cripple their marriage or psychologically cripple their children as a way to get revenge uh, from their faithless husband or um, all that, all those stories are psychological. And you should be able to understand that if you were in that situation, you could do that. Because when you realize that, then you realize you have to correct yourself. You're no better than some of these people. Um, and so that's, that's important, too. And then that would bind us together, no matter what so-called religion or culture we have. We all have this capacity for good or evil. Um, also, the fabric of society, we're constantly weaving people together in a different way. And this is huge now because we know since COVID especially that um, everything is disrupted. And so we really have to weave the fabric of society together in a way that, that is sustainable, that's substantially different. It's got to be much less racist, sexist, religiously intolerant, and sustainable. And there are plenty of forces that are pushing for uh, weaponizing religion, more sexism, more ethnic uh, conflict, and more fossil fuels. So they're really, you know, it's all of you have a lot of skin in the game on this. Your lives, your futures will be very much affected by it. So I think you ought to prepare for um, a life where there are nonviolent demonstrations and you decide if you want to participate or not and how you want to participate. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, the atom bomb. All right. So. Does anyone want to make a comment about that article, something else they read in that article, or one of those excerpts? So I'll start with Samantha. Ah, hi, Professor Beck. There hi. was one thing that stood out to me, and I guess I was reading the um, Buddhism stuff from, I guess what was required for the this class, and one thing that really stood out to me, I believe it was in um, this document, and it was the 
six acts, ah, aspects of religion. And it was talking about um, Buddha's response to a lot of things. And I thought it was very interesting when they're talking about how there's really no authority within that kind of practice and how everyone seeks his or uh, his or her own salvation. And I find that very fascinating, especially since when you look on the opposite side of that being of Christianity for the longest time, the Catholic church was the one authority. And then that didn't work, go very well and ended up splintering in a lot of different um, sectors of Christianity. So that's one of the things that I found very interesting on how those two, I don't necessarily know if they consider Buddhism a religion or if it's more of kind of a way of life, but how those two splinter that way. Again, it's really a way of life. And labeling a religion was a way that Westerners maintain dominance. Um, that's very important because then we continue to have this split between so-called secular humanists and religion. And it's just really false. And it's based on all sorts of power issues that it's rhetoric, it's political rhetoric. But okay, Samantha, so the first round, I just wanted to get the Gandhi stuff. And the second round was to get what you were saying, which okay. is, that uh, was fine. Did you have any reaction to the Gandhi stuff? Um, I believe I gave my reaction last class. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yes. I thought Over we had that. Okay. So why don't I do it this way? If you all think you gave your reaction to that last time, um, why don't each of you do both then? If you have any more to say about Gandhi, and then what was your first reaction with the Buddhism? We'll do two in one. So, Rossi. What do you think? I'm going to do a reaction, my first reaction with Buddhism. So um, I want to talk about the um, one of Buddha's preaching, which is um, Buddha preached a religion devoid of tradition. Yet in Cambodia, that's the opposite. So people are devoted to traditions and social norms. So I just don't understand why people call themselves like devoted Buddhists, yet do not follow the preachings. Like Buddha wants to, us to free ourselves from the past and to live in the present state. But many Cambodians, especially those in the countryside, they live their lives where they encompass themselves and they wrap themselves around social norms, around traditions, and they can't free themselves from that. So they're not moving forward, but they are stuck in, uh, they're stuck in their past. They are stuck trying to please other people, trying to please other generations, yet they do not find their, their own peace, their, their inner, like their inner happiness. Good. I, okay. So it is important to see the pattern here. Okay. Jesus was trying to reform Judaism. He didn't. Yeah. And he wanted to say the essence of the gospel or the whole, the essence of the old Testament, actually love God, love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. And it had gotten all buried into laws and orthodoxy and social norms, right? Socrates, same thing, right? Democracy requires you go out into the agora, you ask people what they think, you live, you have critical thinking. That's not what happened, right? Athens is the greatest and blah, blah, blah. So um, now we're into, and then Confucius, Confucius, you know, um, he didn't want people to worship him. He didn't really want a doctrine. The sayings are meant to, to inspire you and to get you to live a certain way, but he didn't want to be worshipped. And they had a little quote about how he rolled out his mat or rolled up his mat. I mean, it just becomes obsessive about this one person. Um, so then Buddhism, it's the same sort of pattern, right? It gets pushed into social norms, orthodoxies, rituals, and, and usually religion, I didn't know this because my religion was very progressive growing up, but most religions are conservative forces in society because they do get entrenched. But none of the religious leaders were. <laughs> they were completely out of the box progressive. So yeah, too bad, Rossi, but it's really nice to hear it from somebody 
who grew up in a Buddhist country and is serious about her Buddhism. That's why I was happy we could have these joint classes. Um, Thomas. Hey, so um, I don't believe I reacted last time to um, Hinduism. So just to first off, start with that. One of the things that stood out to me was how um, they said that nonviolence is kind of a part of the inner spirit of a human. So violence is the body, violence is the outer spirit, you know, the outer part of you. And nonviolence is the inner spirit. They said that once you find that inner spirit, going back to a way of violence is impossible, which really struck me. I mean, that is very similar to humanism as a whole. And I thought it was very interesting because it just goes back to seeing every human as, in a sense, equal, that no human is born any more violent or less violent than another. Everybody has nonviolence within them. I think it stood out to me because it is, in a sense, kind of like an awakening, an enlightening to seeing you know the value of people around you so that's really what kind of stuck out to me and really struck a chord with my worldview and uh starting on buddhism uh one of the things that kind of hit me was when um buddha was first kind of going through his discovery and he was going through the process of uh, asceticism and really you know stripping himself bare and starving himself till he said um till his stomach touched his spine till his head was wrapped around you know, and he passed out and he nearly died. And through this, he found out, you know, it's futile to live this way if I end up dying. And that was kind of how he sat on the middle path. And it just really kind of struck a chord with me because I see a lot of people not like practicing that same concept of starving themselves till they're nearly dead and depriving themselves, but kind of having to experiment with their life, you know, with work or with school or studying or just any vice, it's all about finding that middle ground, which kind of goes back to what Socrates and Aristotle were talking about. Yeah, but, um, that's why I like yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just sort of surprising to me how the themes keep coming up. Is that the way with you, Thomas? Uh, yeah, definitely. It just all ties together. And you know, you talked about this before, you talked about how you would think of these things and you think that they're original thoughts and then you start reading some more and it turns out everybody's thinking this way. And it's just crazy. Everything ties together. I told you at a certain point, you're going to have this eye roll reaction. <laughs> Not this again. Uh, but it's certainly, if you hadn't taken this class, you probably not would, would not have thought that, right? Because that's Absolutely. kind of how it gets presented to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, the humanism thing also, Thomas, I was just at the birthday party of my uh, granddaughter, right? So kids, when they're little, definitely they need to be nurtured, right? Mm -hmm. They need to be put in the tightest bubble you can possibly imagine. They need to be loved. They actually physically, you know, start getting sick. Um, every kid needs to be bonded with their mom. If they're not, they have serious problems the whole rest of their life. So you have that. And that's what they say is natural, right? It's natural to love and be loved. But it's the way the kid is also vulnerable, right? But they become aware of their vulnerability in their relation to the outside world, right? And that's where they get aggression, right? Violence is a response to vulnerability. And so that comes from outside, whereas the need to be loved is really deeply from the inside. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And then you just keep developing over time, right? As a kid, you get molded one way or another. And eventually every kid has to get out of that bubble and understand people aren't always nice and stuff like that. But if they get harmed too much as a kid, they really don't function very well for the rest of their life. Um, does that make sense? That's all kind of... Um, and, and that would be humanism, right? That could be definitely humanistic. Um, Aiden, what about you? Hey, Dr. Buck. So with the Gandhi thing, I wrote about it already. I didn't talk about it, though. My main reaction was, um, I don't know what y'all talked about in class, if y'all talked about, but when it said that he slept with young women in his later years just thought that was very odd uh, not something I knew about him um, 
And just reading about it, it sounded like he did a not, Okay, he didn't have sex with him. Okay, it's right. not that. Okay, go ahead. I, I read that, but it's just an odd thing to, because he said he was testing himself to do it, right? And to me, it sounded more like an excuse to sleep with them than next to really to test them. yourself. <laughs> he um, just slept next to them. Right, next to them, to sleep next to them. And then I, because I just thought it was weird, so I looked it up online, and it said he also would sleep with his niece next to his niece. Just, I don't know, very weird. Didn't know that about Gandhi. Um, and then, so with the Buddhism thing, um, what I like about it mostly is that it's really easy for people to practice, and um, it's not... Like I'm looking at it right now and it says six aspects of religion. But in my other class, I learned that it's more of a philosophy than a religion. Right. And I heard of other people um, like practicing Buddhism with their religions because Buddhism does bring like a peace and inner peace. And it preaches that. And like I've gotten into yoga just with baseball. Right. And one of my teammates is really big on inner peace and he uses a lot of the Buddha ideas. So um I just, I like that it's uh, like you can do it alongside stuff. Whereas with other religions, you can't do that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And again, it's a way of life. So when um, Taranga and Narosha, oh, I can't remember their last names because they're my buddies. You know, the people who teach math and chemistry. Um, they're Buddhists, they grew up in Sri Lanka and they just say it's a way of life. And um, it's just, it was before, again, that's all just a Western category imposed on these traditions. Um, and I think, why does Houston Smith say religion? Well, because he, you know, he, there wasn't that much of a worry about the word. It's only since we've gotten into post-colonialism and start to dig out some of this stuff and find quotes that say things like, we got to get rid of this, you know, and stuff like that, that then, then it becomes compelling to eliminate the word. But does that make sense, Aiden? The spirit of it is exactly the same. And it is... Buddhism, you know, you shouldn't call it a religion, really. Uh, same with Confucianism. It's more like an ethic. Um, okay, that's interesting that in baseball, they're getting into that. Um, oh, yeah, okay. All right, so um, Shamima. Shamima, are you there? Okay. Kasturi? Um, so, yes, Professor. I think that I reacted uh, to the Hinduism part, but then I did not talk about the Gandhi part. So, as... Um, I didn't say it. I also found it uh, really weird when I went through the statement that said that he slept naked with two females because uh, we Hindus, uh, Hin uh, I mean, in Hinduism, we don't uh, consider it as moral act because um, sleeping with other females uh, rather than wife is not considered uh, good. <laughs> And uh, so you know, what I liked about uh, Gandhi is that uh, he used to uh, support nonviolent movements and stuff because um, uh, actually uh, a royal massacre took place in Nepal when I was not even born. And uh, that led uh, to the destruction of the entire monarchy system in the country. So uh, I mean that if... Uh, if the uh, authorities associated with uh, that monarchy would have uh, taken the steps and policies uh, told by Gandhi related to nonviolent movements, then uh, then the country would still be able to have uh, kings and queens in 
Nepal. I feel, I mean, uh, it's good that we are a democratic nation at the present, but then uh, I would really love to see a nation and become a part of the nation where uh, the rule was uh, done by king and queen. And uh, so for the reaction to the Buddhism part, um, I mean, I really liked what uh, Gautam Buddha uh, used to think uh, uh, so actually, uh, we we uh, have uh, some stories related to Buddha in our curriculum books as well. Uh, so when I think I was in my third standard when I studied a story um, where uh, Gautam Buddha was teaching a woman called Gautami about life. Uh, so uh, Gautami, she, uh, she will uh, lost her husband, her husband will die and she will ask for assistance to Gautam Buddha and Gautam Buddha will tell her to bring some sort of seeds from a house where no one has ever died. And uh, it's impossible, right? But then uh, the woman, she will be, Gautami, she will be in a very uh, big sorrow and grief and uh, she won't be able to use her mind. That's why she will roam around the entire village, entire towns and cities, but then she will not find any seeds uh, from the house uh, where no one has died. So after a long um, journey, she will come back to Gautam Buddha and she will tell him that, Lord, I have realized that it's not possible to find any place where people uh, don't die. So um, uh, from this, uh, he uh, teaches us that uh, uh, it is the law of nature that uh, once a human being is burned, then he has to die. Yeah, actually. There I are a lot of stories that I have heard about him and uh, I think that I never have any negative comments on what his thoughts were and what he uh, teaches to human civilization. Yeah, that's good. I, I, there was another story, folk story, I, that reminds me of this because the fear of death is a big deal, right? And so, and it does drive people to be irrational, I think. It's a terrible drain on our healthcare system that people are so obsessed about staying alive another year or two, and they're spending so much money, and they can't, they just can't get accepting of the body wears out. But anyway, besides that, there was this folklore that at the beginning of the, the world, um, the God got people all together and they could take a vote. Okay, you have two choices. You can live forever or you can have grandchildren, but you can't have both, <laughs> right? And so the point is, oh, I think I'd rather have the cycle of life, right? Does that make sense, Kasturi? That it's another story about how yeah, people yes, yeah, just does. accept the cycle of life. Um, and again, you could be a, purely secular humanist and think these are really great stories about getting people understanding that the fear of death is not, should not drive you, right? Um, Blaine, what do you think? Uh, professor, sorry to interrupt yeah, Blaine and Professor. So I have one doubt regarding um, Buddha as well. So actually, uh, Buddha was born in Nepal, but then uh, India claims that he was born in India, right? So, <laughs> Professor, don't you think that it is quite unethical? I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? Because uh, uh, we have a lot of proofs that he was born in Nepal, and we have already established uh, lots of monasteries and stupas in the country. And uh, actually there is a proof. I mean, uh, we still have the place where he was born. I mean, there are uh, some stone scriptures where it mentions that he was, he was born in Nepal, but then I have heard, I'm not really sure because I have not uh, traveled to India, but then I have heard that uh, 
they will teach their students that he was born in India and they have created artificial living place of Buddha in India as well. I mean, they came to Nepal, they visited the place where he was born, they went to the palace that he grew up in and they have made exactly the same structure there. And I mean, uh, it's good uh, that they like Buddha, but like um, liking other people doesn't really mean that they have to have those people as their national personality, right? Yeah, no, I, I get that. And I've heard that before. So one of the issues we're going to talk about, or one of the issues you can write about is the way that religion gets used as a weapon, because it's powerful. It has to do with all of our basic drives for meaning and purpose and it doesn't necessarily ask for evidence right that's why you want to unite reason and faith but you should you know this is just an example of how religion's getting used to promote a political agenda which is exactly what the west did when they called these things religions right and um so as long as my job is just to get you to help you understand that there are these patterns. And you could maybe try to look up when did this start? Who started this belief, right? And what was their motive and things like that. So yeah, I, and then you have to understand that, you know, these virtues in the spiritual life, it, it, it's there. And then you have the particular place you were born so the particular fixations and imbalances and, you know, politically motivated corruptions are the ones that you happen to grow up with. And then there's the ones that uh, Americans grow up with. And every country will have a history where there is there are examples of religion being used as a political tool. Is that good, Kasturi? Does that work for you? Yeah, Professor, thank yeah. you for clarification. Yeah, and you know, the kids from India probably like they never thought it wasn't true. So when you grow up as an adult, you have to reconsider everything and look back and find out the background instead of just defending whatever you were told. That's again what I'm asking you to do is that you just have to relook at everything uh, and then come to a more complete point of view right um okay blaine what have you got hello uh i want to talk about uh whenever i was reading the stuff something that caught my eye was it's the the one e comma buddha short quotes pdf <laughs> yeah so uh basically all of them like they're very contradictory to everything good old southern americans were <laughs> taught because don't believe in anything simply because you've heard it believe your elders no matter what <laughs> same with second one same with third one i know believe the bible is a hundred percent true believe it entirely believe in your elders <laughs> i know isn't that amazing uh, <laughs> It's just kind of funny. Like, they're well, not only opposite. that, he asks you to use scientific method, right? Yeah. Observation <laughs> and analysis, anything agrees with reason and is conducive to the good. Yeah. Thank you, Blaine. <laughs> <laughs> like the I, polar opposites. Yes. Kind of. No, not kind of. I, I mean, I get it, Blaine. And that's why I used to put this on the overhead when the students came in. And I, I did tell the students, my goal is to blow your mind every day. And instead of getting them to think I'm an atheist and I corrupt the youth, right? I say, no, no, my job is to completely blow your mind. And then I say, well, what do you think? Did I succeed today? <laughs> yeah, Blaine, very good. Um, and But I mean, it's interesting to me, the other students were they taught their religion to be that anti-science, right? And it, it's amazing to me that in America, we have more religion that is raving anti-reason 
than these other countries, developing countries. That's pretty crazy, right, Blaine? I mean, yeah. 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 That's, that's the culture war thing, right? We have the most scientists, the most techies, and the most anti-scientists. Wow. Um, Nahida. Yes, ma'am. So while I was reading uh, Buddha, Buddhism by Huston Smith, yeah. so um, I liked the way he li he introduced himself. So Buddha's name itself expressed the reflection of the book. What I came to know is uh, Buddhist believe that the human is uh, human life is one of suffering, and uh, everything has a cause, and we uh, we should come uh, we should discover the way to come out of it. So as solutions, uh, there's short meditation, spiritual and physical level and God behavior are the ways to achieve it, achieve enlightenment or nirvana. So I like the solution as well. Okay, good. Very good, Nahida. Um, and we'll talk about that some more. Did you grow up, Nahida, what country, what religious tradition or cultural tradition did you grow up with? Bangladesh and I'm Muslim. Okay, good. Well, that's that's what I want for people to appreciate each other's traditions. Um, Destiny. Destiny? Hello. Hi. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about Buddhism, to be honest. Like, I recognize that um, it brings peace to a lot of people to feel that um, detachment from the world um, can ease their suffering. But at the same time, um, you have to care about things to change anything. And I'm not really sold on the idea that there is a world beyond this one. So if you forgo caring about this world, you may not have anything else. So that's what I got. Okay. Actually, you know, nirvana means that you do fade away. It's not like an ultimate judgment and um, uh, virgins or, you know, flute playing and all that stuff. I mean, uh, harps or anything like that. <laughs> but anyway, actually, the second day on Buddhism, we are going to talk about the failure of Buddhists to act in the face of um, sex trafficking, prostitution, right? That they, there's a criticism that it gets to be too passive and not enough social justice oriented. So that is a weakness or that there are other people that agree with you, Destiny. Does that make sense? I mean, you're, you're in good company, every religion or every tradition, every way of life has its strong points and its weak points. Okay, um, Shahaz. Okay, is she there? Okay, Jamie. Yes, Professor. Go ahead. Did you have a reaction to the reading? Professor, can I pass for today? Okay. Um, Giovanni. Um, so before I, I give a reaction, I had a question. Is Buddhism and Hinduism, is it like really, because I was reading and I noticed like Buddhism originated in India and Hinduism, I think has a lot of ties to India as well, if I'm not mistaken. So I was just, I wasn't, on, I, I didn't know if it's like, it's the same thing, if it's like totally different. It's now that's where, that's where, you know, India, Hindu, but Nepal is Buddha. Um, that's where there's this controversy, um, uh. right? And 
Buddha started out Hindu and then he was involved. He wanted to reform Hinduism and they kicked him out. So it became a different religion. Just like Jesus wanted to reform Judaism, they kicked him out, became a different religion. Uh, so, blah, blah, I don't know if you can con confirm this for me, right? But I once heard a story, right? So it's kind of crazy, but I don't know if it's true. And I was still like, there was this one king from England and uh, I think it was uh, Catholic. And I think it wasn't allowed that you can get divorced or something like this. And this king didn't like that. And like the king was so mad or whatever. And he like, he branched off and started like his own religion. And right. that's where like Anglicanism came that's up. Exactly was that real? Right. So is, that, is that, uh, so is that kind of like the link of like Buddha, Buddhism and Hinduism is kind of similar and it's just like small differences? Well, the thing about it is King Henry VIII wasn't worried about the corruption of the priests or anything. He just wanted an heir to the throne. Uh, um, so he actually agreed with a lot of the theology, whereas the other ones were really reform movements. They were about corruption. Does that make sense, Giovanni? Yeah, I understand. Okay. Well, well, for me, how I personally feel uh, about Buddhism is like, I feel like it's something where you can see why why people would believe in it because it's like peaceful and stuff like that. It's like nonviolent and it's like, it's a good way to live by. But like, as for me, like I grew up Catholic. So it's like, I've always had that belief in like Jesus and whatnot, you know what I mean? So it's kind of hard like to, to just believe that like, just meditation and like just zoning off and just being on your own, I guess, so to speak, would like work without like trying to, I would say, reach out to the person you believe in. You know what I mean? Well, sure remember on the, I mean, one thing, remember the Hindu had the, the yogi, like there's different paths to God, right? Uh, and so, um, so Buddhism would be one, the path of the yogi, right? The one who meditates. I understand. And so you could just, you're basically you're finding out about yourself, right? And you're finding out if you really need to make God into a person, right? Because that's uh, how it works for you, the path of the heart. Or if you really are the path of action, right? The way you live out your faith is through your actions. Does that make sense, Giovanni? I got you. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, good. Um, and the Catholic Church does have the monastery tradition. So it does try to cover a lot of bases. But, you know, most Catholics aren't monks or, or nuns. They're mostly uh, on the daily life. And they're either the path of the heart or the path of reflection, path of action. Um, uh, and again, the other thing is Buddhism, and we'll talk about this next time, it broke into two branches and one branch was the, mon the monks and the other branch was the people who went back into the world. And so if you remember Buddha, on the one hand, he devised all these meditation. On the other hand, he did the, he was asked, why don't you just, you know, die now that you've reached enlightenment? He said, no, no, somebody will understand. So he went back into the world. And so that's, uh, where, uh, does that make sense, Giovanni? Yeah, I, I understand. Okay, so it is, I mean, it's amazing the way these patterns just naturally emerge. So I like it when students start with their own experience and then I can go, oh yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's there. Like everything that you wonder about, that's why like, if you can realize that the things you wonder about the most really there's an archetype for that like you're a human being that makes you human uh, when you feel the most isolated that's if you can get that the wisdom literature is trying to connect with you when you feel most isolated and uh, anyway that was the i think uh someone is trying to ask you a question in the chat oh really okay um all right let's see um let's see okay also found it weird yeah okay um okay i have a question um okay we're gonna get to untari i was just um 
Okay. Uh, let's, okay, Untari, your turn. Hi, Dr. Beck, am I audible? Well, it's a little bit fuzzy, if you can make it clearer. Oh, let me try one second. Hello? That's yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just one, uh, one of my questions, but I think my reaction about Buddhism is that I want, I want to say about Buddhism that I think they are trying to teach us that pain is inevitable. Okay, um, Untari, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll have to talk slower because it is just a little, it's a little bit mushy. Oh, okay, okay. Um, is it better, Professor? Not really. Oh, I can just type it in the chat. She says that right pain now. is inevitable, like that's what Buddhism is trying to teach us. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. And, and I mean, that is true. But by understanding the origin and how the pain is going to affect our life, the suffering can be optional. That's what Buddhism tried to teach us, I think. And he, he tried to teach us that the, to deal with the pain instead rather than escape from it. And as a human, I think we can all agree with that. It's such a real, it, it's so relatable. And Buddha might try to teach us, um, to tell us that there is peace in every pain, I think, Professor. There is what in everything? Peace. Peace? In every pain. Okay. So you like the way that he said life is suffering. Yeah, they, they try to teach us to deal with it rather than escape from it, right? And as a human, we know that there is, uh, there always be a pain in everything we do. Okay. They try to teach us to deal with it and to get, uh, maybe to have a peace, even though we are suffering in life. Okay. Okay. That's, that's good. I mean, he says the cause of suffering is desire right? We mm -hmm. care about this stuff. And the cure for um, suffering is release from desire, right? And yeah. then the eightfold path is how you get to release from desire. So um, yeah, we'll talk about that some more. And I will actually next time, I think we, I talked about unjust suffering. And I had all of that whole list of three pages of causes of suffering and i think we'll compare that to what buddha says and you guys can think about that um does that sound like something you might want to do yeah i hope so um shanjida shanjida you got a reaction Okay. Um, Haley. I just found it really interesting um, that Buddhism encourages its followers to think for themselves and they question those in authority. Because I guess growing up in Christianity, like the Bible is the way you um, respect it, follow it. But in Buddhism, it's saying like, don't necessarily just go with the flow. I thought that was interesting. I hadn't thought that way before. Yeah, it is very different. Um, yeah, I was raised that I had to work out my own theology. My dad, who's my preacher, tells me when I'm eight years old. <laughs> so, yeah, when I came to Lyon, it was really a shock. It was a culture shock. Um, anyway, so that is something for the rest of you truly to think about how much of your tradition, your cultural tradition, which includes maybe one of these traditions, how much of it is anti-science and how much of it is just doesn't talk about science and how much of it is 
compatible with science. And when we get to Islam, of course, that'll become a big issue. And I think a number of you probably have, there's probably disagreement among Muslims on that, just like there is with Christians. But anyway, so let's go to, ah, all right. The first thing I wanna do is, oops, sorry, is to tell you the story of, first of all, I have to tell you a little bit about Jesus' life and birth and coming of age. And then I have to tell you about Buddha. And um, because I knew the whole Jesus thing as a preacher's kid, when I read Houston Smith talking about Buddha's background, I just like my jaw dropped. And I think maybe Blaine, is that true of you? That when you read this, you go, oh my God, this sounds so much like Jesus. Did that occur to you? Partially. Um, I mean, they both have very similar things, like they're trying to change something that already exists. Um, they hurt themselves trying to do it. Um, oh, actually, I'm, let me go back to, um, okay, so what I was getting at was, um, okay, the angel Gabriel came to Mary, right? We're going back there to, and said, you know, you're going to have this baby, and she was a virgin. And okay, so here are the oh, and then Buddhism can like <laughs> walk after seven days and stuff. And he right, came. okay, so maybe Rossi, uh, I don't know if you know the Jesus story, but how about if I tell you, you know, the Jesus chapter and you tell me the Buddha, right? The analogous thing. Um, so Jesus, um, so Gabriel told her she was going to have this baby and he was going to be special and then she got married to joseph but then right about the time the baby was due she had to go to register to bethlehem they had the the political leader had told everyone they have to go back to their hometown to register right and so they're traveling and while they were traveling she gets uh, her time to have the baby comes. And for Jesus, it was in a manger. Okay, there was, they got to an inn, but it was full. So they couldn't stay in the inn. So they went to this manger. And so Jesus was born literally in a manger where animals, you know, eat their hay. And then um, there were some wise men from the east who saw a star going over and they, they thought that this special person was going to be born and they came and bowed down and worshiped him and that, that he's going to be more profound than the wise men, right? The wise men know the doctrines and they know this, just like Buddha went to the Hindu gurus and Brahmin, and they knew all the doctrines and everything, but this is going to be something bigger than that. Then when Jesus was 12 years old, um, he went to, they were on going, uh, doing a trip for Passover. And on the way back, his parents lost him, lost track of him. And he, they eventually found him in the synagogue, talking to the rabbis about religion. And the rabbis were very impressed with his insights. And uh, when his parents came, they were mad at him. How come you didn't stay with us? And he said, did you not know I would be in my father's house? Okay. So he had this, he was a normal kid. He grew up with his carpenter dad in wisdom and stature. But then he had this, you know, there was this little thing. And then um, the the thing about it is it's as if his parents had forgotten <laughs> that, yeah, this kid was, you know, conceived by God and all that. Why should you be surprised? Um, but then Jesus in his, uh, when he was 29 or whatever, he got baptized and John the Baptist said, you know, this guy is special. And then there was this revelation this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. 
Then he went and spent his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And then he came down. He had three temptations and he um, started his ministry. Okay, Rossi, do you want to do you want to do your? <laughs> so um, I don't know like all the story, but this is like kind of what I heard. And there are like in, like paintings and stuff at the pagodas to tell the both story. So the story started like about like. A long time ago and it happened in a small Indian kingdom between the border of India and Nepal in a village called Kapilavastu and back then Queen Maya she's the queen of that small Indian kingdom she had a dream that a beautiful white elephant offered her a lotus flower and then entered the side of her body and then that's when um, kind of Buddha started in her womb. So um, from then on, um, one day, um, like one of the, um, so like one of the, um, I don't know it in English, what can I say it in Khmer? Like one of the prims told the queen that uh, one day he would either conquer the world or become an enlightened being, the Buddha. And then um, from then on, after she heard that, um, she was always already making her way from a uh, Kapila Vastu to her father's kingdom to give birth. And um, Buddha was said to be born on the way at uh, Lum Lumbini. I don't know what that is. Um, and like underneath a sal tree. And so like um, people said that when Buddha was born, he took his first step and like after seven days, he was able to talk and not to talk. He was able to communicate in a way that he understands pain, like understand like what other people are feeling. So from a young age, he, he, he devoted himself to understand like why people suffer, like him growing up. He grew up in a wealthy family, but it's in a rice farming um, neighborhood. So he doesn't understand why his people like are like going, like are struggling. So he, he spends his life trying to understand that, but he couldn't. So when he couldn't, he decided to give up his lavish life and two of his kids so he's already married and so he gave up his kid and his wife his kingdom and he went to the forest um, and endured poverty just trying to understand suffering because he was moved by that but when he went there he's not like satisfied like with the answers that he gets so um, he promoted this idea of the middle way which is living a life of balance, not being selfish and devoted to the rich or struggling and just trying to meet and ends meet. So he's trying to find that middle ground. So there's no social indulgence and no deprivation of anything. And then um, after years of meditation and trying different techniques, he was able to reach Nirvana and that's enlightenment and then he didn't stay there he came back he spent his life teaching other people how to find that inner peace and how to achieve that spiritual state where you're free from sufferings right okay yeah. good um all right so uh professor yeah go I'm ahead to add actually. up on what just Rasi said. So actually, uh, there's a myth uh, where it says that uh, actually there are uh, paintings of Lord Buddha uh, uh, where he seems to be walking on uh, lotus flowers. So it is said that he uh, took seven steps when he was burned. Uh, it's strange, but <laughs> I don't know whether it's true or not. We can actually find uh, paintings uh, where he seems to be walking. And uh, also there are stories where uh, it says that he actually took seven steps when he was burned. Uh, so uh, because of that, um, I mean, uh, there was something uh, uh, special in him when he was burned. 
because like um, uh, there was some purpose of his birth on the planet because like uh, I we uh, human beings have never I, I think that none of us has have ever seen anyone uh, taking seven steps when uh, people are born right and uh, there is a similar uh, story on one another king one another king of nepal so uh, it is said that he um, he also uh, uh, so he was provided with card and uh, the um, priest he gave the king the card and uh, uh, so he said that if the king took uh, i mean if the uh, king ate the card then he uh, would be able to speak up i mean whatever he would speak it would be truth but true but then if the card uh, fell on his uh, feet then he would be able to conquer all the places that he uh, steps into that's why he was able to conquer and unify nepal so uh, it is true as well because like uh, he has he has uh, unified each and every places of nepal because he took step into those places and i don't know whether these stuffs are true or not but then uh, well, whenever we whenever we uh, see what contribution these personalities have made for their particular country then it seems that it is true well i think <laughs> that, okay so what i think is that the way that um wise people write art they write stories and those are legends and i don't think they're intended to be scientifically accurate or historically accurate, right? That's why, I mean, why is this pattern? Why is Jesus and Buddha, they are so similar in these stories that kept passed down. So when people emphasize, oh no, Buddha is different or Jesus is different, then I'm different than you, you know, I mean, that instantly separates people. And so then religion can be used as a weapon. And again, it separates. I don't think any of these traditions were ever intended to be used to separate people. And people do, if they want to take it literally, it's used as a tool to say one religion's better than another. Um, but, so let me just go back to these stories. Um, and the similarities. And then you can also see how, um, okay, Buddha and Jesus. And this corresponds with psychology. The psychologists say that um, at about in your late 20s, it's your brain just keeps expanding. And about in your late 20s, there is this sort of gelling that goes on. And so there are lots of stories of people who in their late 20s, they figure out what they want to do. And um, I know that was true of all three of my children. They went to college and then they started their spiritual odyssey, basically, trying to figure out what you wanna do. So one goes into Teach for America. They went into a lot of NGOs. They did a lot of work for not very much pay so that they are not in it for the money. Um, <clears throat> they traveled quite a bit. They met a lot of different people. And then for all three of them, it was about age 27. And they just sort of decided, okay, this is, this is where I want to go. And um, it's not like it's, you know, written in stone. My daughter has changed her, um, who she works for. And my other daughter has, yeah. I mean, but it is a natural, this is natural. And so to say that Jesus did this or Buddha did this, um, it might be historically accurate, that's fine. It's just an archetype. It's a type of person, a type, a way of life. And it's something that all of us can aspire to, to some extent, but it shouldn't separate us by by these traditions. I again, I hate to say religion, but let's say I'd like to say philosophical traditions, and those include all of what we're talking about. So, 
Okay, so both all, both of them had a kind of seriousness of purpose. Um, and I think, again, every human being should be serious about life um, because it is serious and it's serious for you um, to live well so you don't hurt other people, so you don't destroy your society. I mean, you have a lot of responsibilities as a human being. Um, but there are these legends. He would grow up to be a leader. The legends grow, grew up. Um, Buddha, his parents would to be told this, Jesus. Um, and in both cases, the parents were determined to try and make this kid more normal, right? <laughs> they were afraid. They wanted to forget about that. Uh, Buddha's parents tried to get him to care about material things so he would want to be a conqueror. Um, and okay, so Buddha, if you remember, Buddha had the four passing sights. He was protected, but he was allowed to go outside and he saw someone who was sick. And he had never seen that. He saw, he saw death, he saw aging, and then he saw a monk. And that's when he decided, uh, this is what I want. Um, for Jesus, he talked to the uh, religious leaders. There are these indications, right? Then there's the great going forth. So Buddha left home in search of enlightenment. First, he learned the wisdom of the tradition. Then he tried to be an ascetic, right? Extreme self-denial. Then he had the middle way. And then um, he worked on yoga. He sat under the bow tree and he got tempted. This is another one I think is really interesting because Jesus also got tempted. And so I want you to think about why would these be the stories? What's going on? And I, I would assume that Western psychologists could put little thingies on your brain <laughs> and they could find out that this is actually the way the brain works. So the first one was the God of desire. And for Jesus, it was the devil tempted him, turn these stones into bread. So it's all about getting your basic physical desires met. Well, if you try to get enlightened, if you're trying to transcend the body, I'm sure that the body fights back, right? And so um, he had these fantasies about sexy women, right? Because his mind is resisting what he's going to do. And so first, it's going to be physical stuff. The next one is the fear of death. You have to get over that. And then the um, Maya, the evil one, challenged him and said, what right do you have to do this? You're trying to make yourself superhuman. And um, he rejected that, right? And he had this great awakening for 49 days right? He was in just sort of this nirvana state. And then the evil one said, why don't you just die? And he said, some will understand. So his mission is to teach people how to achieve enlightenment, how to break away from the cycle of suffering. Um, and then he began his message. He founded an order of monks, and he challenged the corruptions of the Brahmins, right? Jesus, what did he do? Um, after he was out in the wilderness, um, the devil tempted him, right? First, it's about stones. People do not live by bread alone. So um, you shouldn't manipulate people by saying, I'll do this for, you know, I'll give you money or I'll give you, uh, you know, a job if you do this for me, right? I'll material. Um, motives, uh, um, let's see, ulterior motives of material stuff, then throw yourself down, you know, prove that God, you know, you're special and a miracle will be performed. And um, he, he says you shouldn't test God. So, and this, I mean, preachers violate this all the time. There was one preacher who said he wanted to have a cancer hospital 
and he wanted $40 million or something. And he said, if I don't get it by X time, I'm going to, you know, jump off some skyscraper or something. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, God will save me if that's what's meant. It's just like, that is testing God. That's exactly what the Bible says not to do. But yeah, lots of this stuff happens. Um, and then there's, you have to decide if you serve God or mammon, right? If you worship me, I'll give you power. And so Buddha had that option too. He was either going to be a conqueror or um, a redeemer. So Jesus, the same thing, right? He's, he's going to focus on the, the life of the spirit. And then he preached a re redemptive message. He had disciples. Buddha had fellow monks. Um, that started to teach the, the techniques of Buddhist meditation. Um, neither one of them originally intended to start a new religion. They were just challenging the corruptions of the religious leaders. Uh, both of them, cool head, warm heart, indifferent to social divisions. So this is so important because religion is used to divide people socially, to create social divisions, to entrench social divisions. These people were, but Jesus and Buddha were completely indifferent, right? Simplicity and lifestyle, style, insight into character, self-knowledge, not arrogance. The opposite of the way religion often gets used. Um, what's the difference between a religious leader and a cult leader? Um, a cult is just a group that believes something outside of the mainstream, and it has these disciples. Um, and there's four different kinds, religious, political, economic, therapeutic. Um, so I don't, again, there's some famous ones in the U.S., uh, the Moonies and the um, Waco, Texas, David Koresh. And then there's the one in Guyana um, where the, everybody was a disciple and they would do anything for their leader and they even all died. Just, uh, yeah, it was pretty unhealthy. So what's the difference between a cult, you know, a blind obedience to a leader and Jesus and Buddha, who exactly, that was exactly the opposite of what they wanted. And they criticized the Brahmin for trying to get people to blindly believe in them and criticized the, the priests, the rabbis. Anyway, so, um, so the idea there is that Jesus and Buddha realized at a certain point that they really were serious and they really could affect people, right? So they had a choice. They could either manipulate people or inspire people, right? They had that temptation. And then there are these other people, charismatic leaders, that give in to the temptation to just wrap people around their finger and get rich, get powerful, get glory. Um, so, and I, honestly, I think all of you probably at some point in your life will realize that you're smart and that can enable you to educate people or to manipulate people, right? Because you can talk circles around them. You can convince people of things that uh, are to your benefit just to make money or power, or you can really try to educate people so they won't get manipulated by these people. So education gives you, you know, a huge advantage, but you always have to choose. Um, okay, is it better to emphasize the similarities or the differences? Can any religious tradition become corrupted? So these are themes, right? We're starting to see themes. We have one more religion and, you know, you know where that's going. Uh, Islam is also capable of, you know, it's a good religion and could get corrupted. 
Religion can be used as a weapon. Yeah, I guess so. So here are the slides on Buddha. And then I'm going to show you some um, Buddhist art. Well, let's see. I guess I'm going to keep going, but make sure to have some reaction, you know, written down because I will try to call on you. Um, how about if I do, I'll just do the one, the stories of Buddha. And for next time, I'll do the ink drawings because they are truly amazing. Um, so let me go to the slides. And, and Ra Rossi was saying she was just at a temple that had some of these. But um, so again, for those of you who were raised Christian, um, there, you know, there's stained glass windows and there's all sorts of stuff with little scenes from Jesus' life. And uh, if you, you know, grew up in the church, you know what these stories are, right? There'll be the story of Jesus being born in a manger, and there'll be the story of Jesus in the temple, and there'll be uh, just a number of different sort of scenes from Jesus' life. Uh, him with his disciples, him getting baptized, and then there's always the cross. But anyway, people who are raised in the tradition, they know right away. So here's one where Buddha, uh, after Buddha, you know, lived, people were speculated about what his previous lives might have been like. And so they make up the story that he was previously a goat who um, saved the sheep from getting falling off the cliff or something. <laughs> and I think that's in your, I think that's in the book. Um, anyway, so there's the goat story where Buddha is one of his previous incarnations. Um, here's obviously the story of his birth, which he's dreams about the elephant and she's about to give birth to Buddha. Um, here is Buddha standing up and walking. <laughs> but there are pictures of Jesus also. He's a little man, you know, holding a world. So um, there are, Buddha's not the only one where the, the legend is that he was born already a grown up. <laughs> I, I don't think so, but those are nice legends. Um, Okay, and then this one is a number of scenes from his life. There's the birth. Here is, there are six hand poses um, of Buddha and each one symbolizes something. And um, I, one of them is a teaching pose, Buddha the teacher. This is where Buddha was sent out, member of the four passing sites. He's going outside and they're holding the thing over his head so he doesn't get hot because they're trying to protect him from any kind of pain, right? Um, and then he sees the illness and the death and then finally the monks. Um, then the, this one is the earth pose. That's a very famous one where Maya says to him, why don't you just die now, you know? And he touches the ground and says, some will understand. And I'm, you know, I'm going to stay connected to this, this life for now. I'm going to touch the earth. Um, and then I can't, I can't remember exactly what the other ones were, but it's just this whole narrative. And there are, there's some beautiful um, bronze doors in Florence. Um, by a sculptor starts with a B, but it's very similar to this. And it has all these scenes of Jesus' life. And there's uh, another one. Um, here is him meditating under the tree, right? Under the bow tree. I don't know. I, th I think this stuff, once you understand the story, I don't know. I just get a lot of <laughs> pleasure out of thinking oh yeah this is this it because it reminds me so much of all those Jesus things I saw my mother was an art history professor and we went to Europe we saw all the museums and all the cathedrals and all this stuff so I saw a lot of that stuff and my parents never wanted me to you know to be doctrinal so 
I think this is cool. <laughs> so here are all those um, temptations, right? He's getting tempted and um, he, and he's just sitting there, you know, oblivious. He's overcoming the temptations. Here's another one with all these temptations. I think there's a lot of sexy girls there and uh, fear of death. Uh, and there's his head, right? So there's so many Buddhist statues where he's concentrating. And of course, you're supposed to imitate Buddha. I mean, you're, it's supposed to remind you of your own capacity for staying focused in the face of all these temptations. There's the earth pose again, right? Buddha came back to teach. And so, you know, we are the beneficiaries of his teachings. Um, again, there's another one. And this is one, this is uh, actually, I have much better pictures of this Untari. This is the one in uh, Jogjakarta. You probably know that. Um, that was so beautiful. This is the one in uh, what is now Afghanistan that got bombed. And we have students from AUW who actually live there. And um, one of my students, her father painted this, these statues in different contexts at different times. So we had a whole series of paintings where these statues and in the background would be the, what was going on at the time. Um, and there's the monasteries. So that's the monastic tradition of Buddhism. Um, all right, so I think I will save the ink drawings for next time. But one thing I do want to say, which I'll, um, you can comment on next time, is that you have the philosophy of Buddhism. Oh my gosh, we didn't, I really have to do this thing about authority because a lot of you brought this up. So, so um, what did the Brahmins, you know, claim to have authority? And they talked, they, the caste system had become entrenched. If you remember when I talked about Hinduism, I said, it's just spiritual types. It shouldn't, uh, you know, people who are administrators get more power and money because they work harder and the society depends on them. People who are producers, they get less money, but they just feel more comfortable at a 40 hour a week job. They wanna go home, they wanna do something else. Um, and then they're the spiritual ones, the ones who need time, leisure time to be creative. And then there's the untouchables who somebody's got to do the dirty work, right? And Houston Smith said, well, at least it was never slavery, right? And, but, you know, what happened is a person in the management level doesn't want to admit that he has a child that's really a natural ditch digger. And if you just allow people to be, follow their natural calling, then it's fine. But but that, of course, didn't happen. Everybody wants their little Johnny or Susie to get either the same or more than they had. And so that was a big problem. Um, the Brahmins were spiritual leaders, but they might have kids that are real jerks. <laughs> but their kids get to have, you know, get to be Brahmins. Oh, wait a sec. So that obviously was corrupt. And so his response was no authority. Um, and again, it's very different from this, the Southern Baptists. It's, it wasn't different from what I grew up with, but I guess it is different from most people's background. Uh, rituals, um, and this is um, the birth, baptism, the seven sacraments, right? Uh, marriage, coming of age, like confirmation, death, these are major transitions in your life and um, the Brahmins controlled them. So, you know, you had to get baptized or you were gonna, you know, go to the wrong place in the next. So they, they took control of these rituals and you had to follow them. Do you remember where the women were, people didn't want a daughter because it's the sons who were able to light the funeral pyre and make sure 
every year go through a ritual that would make, make sure their parents went to the right spot uh, after death. Um, so the Brahmins, you know, constructed all that stuff, controlled all that stuff. And Buddha said, forget it, you know, no rituals are necessary. You know, if you get your kid baptized or not, it's nothing, right? Doesn't matter. It's how you live. It's your meditation practices. Speculation, the nature of the universe. Um, so Buddha learned all, you know, the stuff that the Brahmins had preached. Jesus knew the Old Testament, you know, he studied all that stuff. Um, and Buddha says, no, you don't have to speculate. Do you remember where he talks about the someone gets hit with a poison arrow? You don't just sit there and speculate about well, what's the nature of the poison and what's the effect on the body. You just yank the dang thing out. Like, don't analyze it. Just get it out of your body, right? And so, you know, to analyze, there's actually, a, there are so many Plato scholars that just spend their lives trying to figure out what the heck Plato said instead of just doing it, just do what Socrates did. It's really surprising to see that people really do get so hung up in the doctrine or in the texts that they, they completely lose track. They're not living anymore. So he just kept saying, it's your inner experience that matters. And you test it empirically through your meditation practices. He, you know, Houston Smith points out that these practices were clearly tested through empirical methods because they work so well on um, the human's body mind human chemistry human body chemistry um, the tradition um, the brahmin spoke in sanskrit and this also happened in the catholic church was they spoke in latin and most people didn't know latin and so people were intimidated and they just felt like, oh, they must have wisdom that I don't have. Um, and Buddha rejected all of that. She so is very egalitarian, right? Break down all the class divisions and all that. He was very, um, women could achieve nirvana. Oh my God, that was completely radical. I mean, it was completely, <laughs> you, can, you know, right? The Hinduism, the way it was, played out by the Brahmins would never have allowed, you know, women to achieve enlightenment, right? Being born a woman means that you sinned or you just got to have at least another one or two incarnations. So that was completely radical. Um, grace. So this fatalism, right? You're a woman because, right, you committed some sins and, um, so they, they used all that. You're, a, you're an untouchable because you need some more incarnations. And, um, and Buddha just said, forget it. None of that. You know, you can achieve nirvana in your lifetime. Everyone is capable of it. There's no previous life that has, you know, determined your fate. So fatalism is out. And then this obsession with the occult miracles so again, religion can be obsessed with miracles and escapism and be used as a drug and also be used as a weapon. So that's why I didn't emphasize these miracles related to Jesus and Buddha, um, because I mean, who cares <laughs> as far as I'm concerned? I mean, Buddha would not want you to focus on that. Jesus would not want you to focus on that. Socrates would people would talk about well he's weird or he just he would not that's not the message it's not the point um same with Confucius right who cares how I rolled up my bed you know my it doesn't matter so stop obsessing about these things um and just uh, it comes from within right enlightenment comes from within so yeah, as usual, I talk too much. But uh, let me just run through this. And then starting next time, um, I think I'll start with the slides. And then I'll have you reacting. And you can present based on anything I've said here. 
and then any of the readings that you're doing for next time. There are not nearly as many readings for next time. Um, there's an article on the women and um, Buddhism. And then there, that's the usual kind of 15 page, not very difficult. There's an outline on Buddhism and the environment. And I also put the article, the scanned article, if you wanna read it, that's optional. And then there's some other things, but not nearly as much reading. Here's the Four Noble Truths. The cause of suffering is desire, and the cure is release from desire. The Eightfold Path. And what you, if you want to do this, you should see right away that it's the same Aristotelian virtues. Um, my preacher today in church, uh, it's about generosity because it's once a year you have to you know, pledge some money, but she just talked about generosity and she just like the way she's taught in seminary is exactly like Aristotle. She doesn't even know it. She said generosity is a virtue of all the virtues in the Bible. It's mentioned the most. And it's just, you know, how, where did we get to the point where we never put these together or what happened to the Western tradition? And we're passing on all these divisions and all this science versus religion stuff to the rest of the world. It's just really, I think it's really bad. Um, so right association is friendships. Aristotle thought friendships really important. And then Jesus and Socrates, and they all had disciples, a few really trusted friends. Uh, right intent, that's important in all of, in all of them, it's your character that determines your motives. You have to do it for the right reason in the right way. You have to do things because they're noble, not for any other reason. Uh, right speech is very important for all of these. Um, right conduct, reflecting on your actions, right? Right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness. Um, and then as somebody who is uh, a lot older than you, I absolutely <laughs> want you to remember this. All we are is the result of what we've thought um, because I have to live with <laughs> myself. There were some times in my life when I got angry. Nobody necessarily, I didn't necessarily yell at anybody or anything, but in my psyche, I got angry. And um, I still have to live with that, right? Um, it's, it's hard. So I would just recommend <laughs> developing uh, the power of reflection so that you, and also trying not even to want to get angry, right? You have to repress it. But even when you repress it, rather than get rid of it, you have to live with that. And um, it, it causes me grief that I couldn't have been more mature and I couldn't have been able to make lemonade when my life was turning into a lemon, <laughs> it, which it was, I mean, I had obstacles, but I would just recommend that you work on learning how to transform your desires and learning how to find creative ways out of situations so that you don't, because you do have to live with it the rest of your life. Um, the concepts, he resisted concepts, he taught um, the characteristics, that's so very empiricist and practical. I think that's amazing again, right? This is not at all the way that in the US people think of Buddhism or religion or anything like that. The two schools of thought, the monasteries and the activists, and then Zen Buddhism. Um, and that's where we'll look at the Zen Buddhist paintings next time. I remember, I, I don't know how many of you can go to a museum that has Zen Buddhist paintings, but oh my gosh, I definitely recommend it. it you will never forget the experience. You just have to take time to stand in front of them. They're like 30 feet tall. And you literally, if you just look at them, they put you into this meditative state. You can't, you just about cannot think about anything else. 
when you're looking at them, the way they have layers and layers and layers of um, reality, right? And it's corresponding to the layers and layers in your psyche. It's trying to get you down into the Atman Brahman. And it is so amazing. Um, so what we'll talk about next time is how the view of reality and the art fit together. And art, ancient art is always trying to use the physical images to get you to a spiritual reality. So it's a really good example of that. Um, and, oh, there was one other thing I was, I wanted to say about those, but slipped my mind. Um, anyway, okay, so I'll see you next time. And you can jot down notes from today. And then when I call on you, you can make comments from today and then comments from um, your readings for next time. Okay, we will see you. Take care.